all of that overlapping of orbitals to generate the molecular orbitals of F2 might have left your brain a little bit frazzled. So I want to take a step back now and talk about a somewhat more fundamental issue associated with molecular orbital theory and introduce the idea of hybridization. So in a lot of molecules, we don't see geometries that would be indicated based on the shapes of, for example, the p orbitals. So in a molecule like ethanol, which consists of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, carbon and oxygen are second row elements, and so the two p orbitals are the valence orbitals. But as we've seen, the p orbitals are aligned along the x, y, and z axes at right angles to one another. So in theory, then, if we're using the atomic orbitals to overlap to form bonds, we would expect bond angles of either 180 or 90 degrees, right? But when we actually look at ethanol and when we optimize its geometry quantum mechanically, we get a tetrahedral structure at every atom. We get bond angles that are closer to 110 degrees rather than 90 or 180. How can we explain the geometry of a molecule like ethanol given molecular orbital theory? Do we need to throw MO theory away and start over, or can we somehow adapt molecular orbital theory to account for these seemingly strange geometries? And we'll talk about molecular geometry in a future lecture. So we can, as it turns out, adapt molecular orbital theory to account for odd geometries. And remember the general idea that molecular orbitals are linear combinations of the atomic orbitals. What we can do then is actually mix the p orbitals on a single atom together to produce customized bond angles. This mixing of atomic orbitals with one another is what we call hybridization. And kind of a general picture of hybridization is shown for you here. The idea is before we ever worry about overlapping atomic orbitals on adjacent or nearby atoms, we take the atomic orbitals that are on a particular atom, say this blue hypothetical atom that I'm drawing at the center of this s orbital and this p orbital, and we combine them with one another to generate a product what's called hybrid AO, which is partially s and partially p. In this case, since we're combining one p orbital with one s orbital, we're generating what's called an sp hybrid. There's nothing too physically profound to the process of hybridization. It's just a mathematical process to help us find solutions to the Schrodinger equation efficiently. The idea is to use the hybrids to build molecular wave functions, molecular orbitals, instead of the pure atomic orbitals, and we do it because it works. We do it because the hybrids show up, in fact, again and again. These proportions of the S and P orbitals show up again and again in molecular orbitals. And so we can use the hybrids as a starting point to kind of give us a shortcut or a leg up when building molecular orbitals from atomic orbitals. We use it because it works. Furthermore, what we can say about hybridization is that the number of bonds at an atom dictates its hybridization. So for example, this carbon here that I'm highlighting red has four bonds, and therefore we can immediately conclude that its hybridization must be sp3. It needs four hybrids to bond to the four atoms it's bonded to, and so we throw four atomic orbitals into the mix, one s and three p's. Let's begin with sp3 hybridization. A typical example is methane, and notice that methane has four bonds coming from the central carbon atom. Four bonds to hydrogens, and so it has sp3 hybridization. You'll see this general figure at the top of all of these slides, and it's just reminding us that hybridization involves the on-atom combination of S and P orbitals to generate hybrids. When we need four sigma bonds, we've got to use all four atomic orbitals to produce four hybrids. And the four hybrids are aligned along the corners of a tetrahedron, so we can draw those with a little bit more detail like this. There's one hybrid that is sort of coaxial with each bond in this structure. This gives you the idea of the positions of the hybrids in space. The resulting hybrid orbitals are called sp3 hybrids, and there are four of them. Remember one of the core ideas of molecular orbital theory that the number of atomic orbitals that we put in is equal to the number of molecular orbitals that we get out. The same idea applies to hybrids. There are four of them since we took 1s and 3p orbitals and mix them together to generate the hybrids. 
let's look at actual calculation results to see what a computer generated sp3 hybrid orbital looks like and what the linear combination of the atomic orbitals looks like that is the hybrid orbital. So here's an sp3 hybrid in methane. The large red lobe is the lobe that's used for bonding with the hydrogen atom. You can see there's really nice overlap between that orbital and what would be the 1s orbital on hydrogen somewhere spherical in the neighborhood of here. Let me draw that a little bit better, actually. So the 1s orbital on hydrogen would be somewhere in this neighborhood, right? So there's great overlap between that hybrid and the 1s orbital on hydrogen. And look at the wave function for the sp3 hybrid and what it's made from. We've got a coefficient of 0.5 for the 2s orbital. We've got a little bit of 2px, a little bit of 2py, and a little bit of 2pz all thrown into the mix. Essentially what this is saying is that the recipe for an sp3 hybrid is part s orbital, part px, part py, and part pz. When we only need three sigma bonds, as in a molecule like ethene or ethylene, which has only three sigma bonds coming from each carbon atom, sp2 hybridization is involved. We take one s orbital and two of the p orbitals to produce three hybrids, since we only need three hybrids for bonding. So this picture is very similar to what we saw for sp3 hybridization, except I've thrown one of the p orbitals away and only combined the s orbital with two of the p orbitals. The resulting hybrids that we get are at an angle of 120 degrees to each other and point along the locations of these sigma bonds like this. And we get these little smaller, much smaller lobes of opposite sign of the wave function kind of on the back side of each hybrid. So the resulting set has sp2 hybridization. And again, we started with three atomic orbitals and we got three hybrid orbitals out. So let's take a look once again at actual calculation results to see what atomic orbitals the sp2 hybrids are made out of. So for this particular orbital, this is actually a typo, this should say sp2. Psi for the sp2, notice, is a little bit of the 2s, it's a little bit of one of the 2ps, and a little bit of another one of the 2ps, but one of the 2p orbitals is not involved at all. The coefficient is 0.0, .0 right? So I just added that in there to show that this coefficient is zero, but of course, in reality, what we're getting is a mixture of only the 2s and two of the p orbitals, with the third p orbital not involved in the hybridization at all. And we'll talk about the role of that third p orbital at the end of this video. Finally, if we only need two sigma bonds from the atom, as in a molecule like ethyne, which has only two sigma bonds from each carbon atom, that leads to sp hybridization. And for sp hybridization, we're combining one s orbital with one p orbital to generate only two hybrids, and the angle between these hybrids, 180 degrees, right? Just like we see in the geometric picture here. Two atomic orbitals get thrown in to produce two hybrids. Notice the equivalence of those numbers again. And we call these sp hybrids since one s orbital is combining with one p orbital in the hybridization phase to generate these hybrids. Once again, let's look at the calculation results. So this is the actual sp hybrid in ethyne. Notice that the orbital is made from some 2s density, some 2p, but two of the p orbitals are not involved in hybridization. And again, this is a typo. This should only say psi of sp. So this, the sp wave function is a sum of 2s and 2p with the px and the py left out, for example, and only the pz involved. What essentially this says is the sp orbital the recipe for an sp orbital is take a little bit of s and a little bit of p and leave out the other two p's. We can in fact keep playing this game for larger numbers of sigma bonds using the d orbitals. So if we need five bonds, for example, we're out of s and p orbitals. There are only four of those total, but we can throw in a d orbital and get sp3d hybridization. For six bonds, we can throw in an s orbital, three p's, and two d orbitals for a total of six to generate six hybrids. We can even go beyond to seven and eight bonds, although molecules like this are actually fairly rare to have that many bonds to a single atom, but hypothetically we could even go beyond sp3d2. You'll never see that in general chemistry. In all of these cases where we generate these hybrid orbitals, the hybrid atomic orbitals, or what we call HAOs, are the inputs for thinking about bonding 
for both approaches, valence bond theory and molecular orbital theory. So if we back up, for example, to ethyne, the way we think about bonding in ethyne, for example, from a valence bond theory perspective, is to imagine the sp hybrid overlapping with the 1s orbital on hydrogen. We can use those hybrid orbitals just like we would use atomic orbitals in a molecular orbital or a valence bond theory context. Now, what happens to the missing p orbitals? What role do these unhybridized p orbitals play in ethene and ethyne? Well, notice in these two molecules that we have more than one bond. The hybrid can be involved in head-on overlap, can be involved in a sigma bond, while the unhybridized p orbitals can be involved in pi bonds with the p orbitals on the carbon atom next door, which is, also has the same hybridization, right? So here are a couple of images of this. In ethylene, what I've done is I've turned the molecule so that its plane is sort of this way. Notice that the pi bond extends above and below. This is just a pi bonding molecular orbital. And these are, this is that unhybridized p orbital that was not involved in the sp2 hybridization of this carbon atom, right? Let's back up to remind ourselves of what that looks like. For the sp2 hybrid, Notice that there's one p orbital that was unhybridized. This self-same p orbital is the one that's involved in pi bonding in ethylene. This p orbital is exactly that unhybridized p orbital. Same idea in ethyne, but now there were two unhybridized p orbitals, right? And so now we can have pi bonds that are at right angles to one another, and this is a little bit difficult to see, but this pi bond is kind of running in this direction while this pi bond is sort of running in this direction, and so these two sort of vectors that I've drawn here are at right angles to one another, just as we'd expect based on the orientation of the p orbitals, right? The px, let's say, is aligned this way, and the py is aligned this way.